You were not Sergeant Pilo. You were absolutely somebody else. This is Jeffrey Pilo, a veteran police officer, a Bloomington police sergeant, and a father of three. But that was his persona before his 2006 arrest. And since then, he's been known as a stalker and serial rapist. All it took was one stranger danger call to the police and his double life was exposed for the world to see. In this video, we're taking you through the interrogation of ex-Sergeant Jeffrey Pilo and how he landed himself 440 years in prison. To get the full perspective of this madman's reign of terror, we have to remind you that his horrific acts started back in December of 2002. He would enter a victim's house with a firearm and knife, threaten them, and sexually assault them. And because he was an officer, he came well prepared to make sure there were no repercussions. He'd use his resources to discover the personal information of several individuals, like the victims, run his own license plate numbers just to check whether his car had been reported or not, and even own burglary tools like black gloves, rope, black ski masks, black coat, and folding knives. We'll get into more details about the four rapes between 2002 to 2005 later, but right now, we're fast forwarding to his almost fifth victim, who became his reckoning in April of 2005. This is Janelle Pengaluska, or JP for short. On April 5th, 2005, she received several hang-up calls at work, which gave her a quote, really bad feeling. She asked a male co-worker to walk her to her car, but shortly after driving out of the parking lot, she noticed a man who had pulled his vehicle behind hers acting suspiciously. She described the man as a white male with a straight nose, a rounder face, a buzz cut flat top, and big sunglasses. Later, on April 10th, 2005, she and her then boyfriend, Scott Galuska, returned to her Bloomington home around 10 p.m. Sometime after JP fell asleep, Galuska woke her up and told her to call the police because he saw someone wearing black gloves standing in her yard. As JP called the police, Galuska ran outside with a baseball bat. Shortly thereafter, she heard Galuska and the man in the yard yelling at each other. The man eventually ran away. But now came the incident which finally got to Pilo. On June 10th, 2006, JP arrived home around midnight. Shortly after arriving home, she noticed that her dog was unusually upset, barking and growling. She then heard what she described as an urgent knock at the door. She responded, but no one was at the door. Shortly thereafter, her doorbell rang, and again, no one was there. She then heard a noise by the side of the house, prompting her to call the police, and she did. Officer David Zemer responded to the call, and to his surprise, he found his superior, Sergeant Jeffrey Pilo, standing with his back against an adjacent house. Officer Zemer was young, and he recognized his superior straight away, but that did not stop him from making the arrest. On the next day, Pilo was brought in for questioning. And from the moment he sits down, things start to get heated. Are you good? Are you good? No. What's going on? This isn't the way we want this to happen, right? We want you to come down here on your own, all kind of stuff, we said chat, all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, it didn't happen that way. You know, you wrote down with the same uh, with with Mosier. And um, as you know, we have rules that we have to go by. Just as you know, you're very familiar with all this stuff, you know what's going on, all that kind of stuff. And we want to talk about what's going on because we're not absolutely sure what's going on. And, uh, what are you talking about? I have to read your rights first. I want to arrest at this point. Uh, you're not free to go. At this point. I'm under arrest. If I'm not free to go, I'm under arrest. Well, we're in a custodial situation. That's why I'm going to read you your rights. Right, because you came because you came down here in uh, their car. I don't know where we're gonna go. I don't know where we're gonna. I don't know where we're gonna What's go. What's going on? I don't even know what you're talking about. I understand that, Jeff, and you understand just like I do that I can't talk about anything until we get this little bit out of the way. Okay. All right. All right. As an officer, he should know that being in custody means he's not free to go. So questioning this makes him look even more guilty. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say cannot be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to talk to a lawyer and have one present with you by any question. 
If you can afford to hire a lawyer, one will be appointed to represent you before any question if you wish. You can decide any time to exercise these rights, and I answer questions and make any statements. Do you understand those rights I explained to you? Yes, of course I do. Okay. I have those rights in mind you wish to speak with me. About what? Okay. Last night, all right, there was a, a, an issue that came up, right? Out on the uh, southwest side of town. All right. You know what I'm talking about? There's a, it's a, I want to hear what you have to say about it. And I'm, I'm really hoping there is a good explanation for it all. I, did you meet up with the police officer last night? You're talking about Zima. Yes. When I was walking around by the lake, looking at the lake down there. Again, I drove down there. I couldn't sleep. All right. Houses come up for sale in that area all the time. I'm interested in buying my mother in a house. She lives up in the really. Uh, she's, you know, she's poor. She's on fixed income. I want her to move closer to us. Houses come for sale. There's a town home right there for sale. It won't work. But anyway, I was looking to see what kind of access went down to that lake. That's all. All right. I was starting to walk around. I parked, walked down, looked at the lake. When I was leaving, where did you park it? I don't know the name of the street. But it wasn't right there where you were at. It was by the lake. That lake is goes behind those houses. You know, you understand how difficult the situation this is for everyone involved, including yourself, really. All yes, right. I understand. And Irregardless of what you know, our feelings are towards each other and all that kind of stuff, I, I, I think we've always got along. I think we've always been able to speak openly right. about that. There are just some things that happened last night that just doesn't add up. And you know, Jeff, you know, as a former investigator yourself, that there are things that we know, okay? Such as the way that uh, uh, you met up with David, you know? You freaked him out. You freaked him out. Um, why would you be why would you be in between two houses looking at because I, I couldn't keep going straight. There's a drainage thing that goes down the lake. I couldn't keep walking. So I walked up, the dog started barking and all hell. So I walked up between the house and then go to the road. All right. He comes around, I thought maybe it was the homeowner. I was like, oh, I don't want to startle, you know. He startled me, so I turned to walk back down. He said, stop, please. I was like, oh, hell, it's got. I turned around and walked back. Jeff, Jeff. Well, you know as being a police officer that that kind, of, that kind of thing is not within the norm. We don't. As police officers, we don't walk around at 1230 at night in the morning walking in between the houses. Well, I walked up walk between the houses. I was by the lake. But I couldn't keep going, so I walked up between the houses. That's it. I mean, that is it. I, I, that's it. Yeah. Think about what you're telling me. I am thinking about what I'm telling you, the truth. I went down there, look, what kind of public access is down there? I walked, I started going to the west side, but there's fences, are, and I, was, oh, hell, I come back around the other way. All right. Again, I can't go no further. There's a drainage thing that comes down and fills that like overflow, I guess, I don't know, whatever it is. So I started, you know, the dog started barking, so I walked up between the houses, go up to the road, and yes, to be on the road, so I'm not walking up between, you know, it's just, uh, I think, well, well, wait, wait a minute, but you weren't on the road until I was going to the road, road. alright, that's where I was walking up to, was go up to the road, walk down to my truck and drive away, because I was done looking at the lake, there's no access going down the lake, so, okay, Jeff, we're past the point of you were there, right? You readily admit that you were there yes. in between those two houses. Yes. All right. All right. I was just walking from the lake up to the... Okay. If you get a call of someone walking in between two houses at 1230 in the morning, I don't know what call brought him out there. Yes, of course. 
of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, the person who called this in world. has every right in the world to do this. Correct? I have no idea who called it in. He claims to be there relaxing his mind by being at the lake and scouting the houses. What doesn't make sense is his using the gap between two houses to get back to his car, and the fact that he's doing all this in the middle of the night. Three minutes in, and he's already looking super guilty. As a police officer, he should have known better than to accidentally put himself in this position. Now, for the next several minutes, he's about to use denial and anger to compel the department to hopefully slide this under the rug. Alright, what they called in wasn't me. Alright. They said last night somebody knocked on somebody's door. I did not knock on anybody's door. I did knock on anybody's door. I did not knock on anybody's door. I, I don't know what else you're trying to allege here. I, I don't want to jump to some kind of conclusion. Right? All of this isn't about because I was walking, I walked up between that, from that lake up between those two houses. Absolutely. I'm sorry. Absolutely. You know, I, I don't know what else you're talking about. We're talking about you know, standing up with your back to the the house and that, and trying not to be identified. What? Having your back up against the house and not trying to be seen as David walks by. I was walking up. I saw someone coming, so I stopped. I turned to go back. Again, I, the dog's barking. I didn't want somebody to think I was doing something wrong. He said, stop police. I was like, oh, hell. So I turned around and walked up to him. I wasn't standing with my back against no house. Well, I, I think you're minimizing all of I'm not minimizing anything. He said, stop police. Isn't there a little bit more than that? No, that's what he said. You didn't see the gun he had pulled on you? No. You were unaware that he pulled a gun on you. I did not know he did that. No, I did not. When I turned and walked towards him so we could see who I was, and then I wasn't a threat. Well, you know, his hand was at his side. He was like, we talked for, for what? We talked for a moment. What did you talk about? He asked me what I was doing. I told him what I was doing. That you were there to look for a house for your mother-in-law at 1230 in the morning. I'm interested in houses in that area. There's that lake. I was looking to see what kind of access there is down to that lake. My mother's disabled. I mean, she, she can walk, but she can't walk too far. Well, I didn't see any access down there. I mean, off the coast, I can go down there. But as far as a, a public sidewalk going down there, I didn't see one. I was going to walk back around and then go to my truck and leave. See, you, you know all the, all the things we say. You've been sitting in this chair before. All I'm saying is that what you need to do is think about just exactly what you're saying. Before you, answer, before, you, before you jump back with a conclusion, Jeff, you need to think about what you're saying. You need to think about what the scenario was right there. You know, I, you may be honest with him. Haven't you been? I mean, I, I mean, I think I need to take a step further. Okay, because the lady, scared to death, scared. To I don't know nothing death. about the lady. But I'm, what I'm telling you, what I'm telling you is, I'm, I'm telling you, she was scared to death. She was an absolute basket case. It wasn't for me. What? Yes, you were in between the houses. You were in between the houses. What if this would have happened? I walked up between the houses yeah. and Zeman was there. That's the only time I went between the houses. What if this would have happened? Would you be a little bit concerned to her? But I don't understand what you're saying. The only time I walked between those two houses was when I was walking from the lake and up. And but that's what that's right. where you and that's when I met the Zimmer. That's when, where you and Officer Zemer differ in what you said. 
But whatever the lady was scared of, it wasn't me. It was you. How could it not be? The only time I was between the houses when I walked up and Zima was there, she'd already called. Jeff, Zima had already been throughout the whole area. You were the only person there. It was 12.30 in the morning. Right. It was 12.30 in the morning. The only time I walked up between the houses, all right, those two houses, was when Zima came in. Alright? I mean, I walked up between, I walked from the lake between the houses, there's Zima. Honestly, I'm not the one scared of women because that's the only time I was there. But you wanted out of there quick. You didn't, you didn't stop and, you know, you said, I'm here looking. Do you think it, let's just run all the way down the line. He's on a call. I'm not going to stay there and talk to him. you. With you, Jeff, think about it. I mean, it just, it is just right down the line. Right down what line? I mean, he's called out there, all right? There's nobody else out there but you. This lady has someone prowling around her windows. She's a very attractive young lady. It wasn't me. I wasn't prowling around anyone's windows. I wasn't prowling around at all. Again, when the dogs bark, I go, I need to go up by the road, and that's when I walk between the houses. Well, what makes you decide to go look at a house at 1 30, I mean, 12 30 in the morning? I wasn't looking into houses. I'm interested in a house in the area. I was looking at that lake. That is all. Officer Zemer responded to the lady's call, and according to his testimony in court, he approached JP's house and saw someone standing with his back against an adjacent house. Seymour ordered the person to walk toward him, but instead, the person turned to walk away with his hands, quote, in his waistband area. Zemer pulled his service firearm and ordered the man to stop, but the person continued to walk away. However, once the man got to the back of the house, he turned and he walked directly toward Zemer. As the man approached, Zemer recognized the man as his former supervisor and a member of his softball team. Before he released the defendant, Zemer noticed that the defendant, quote, had an item of clothing or something under his shirt. Now, this is completely the opposite description that Officer Pilo is giving. He also claimed to have crossed the house once when he was asked to by the officer. But the woman wouldn't make a complaint about one passerby, right? He rang his bell and was snooping outside, so she had to complain. I realized, I just, I didn't do anything wrong. I had, I, we, we as police officers, and we as human beings know the, the difference between right and wrong. It's, yes. It is put in our head from I day understand. one. All right. I did not walk between that. I Again, the only time I walked between those two houses is when I walked, when I was down on the lake, I can't get my front hand. So I walked up to go up to the road. That's it. Okay. And when I walked up there, somebody comes running. All right. Okay. What were you wearing last night? A t-shirt. Shorts, flip flops, and socks. Not flip flops, sandals. Okay. Um, did your t shirt have any writing on it? I don't remember what my shirt had on it. What color was your shirt? Dark. What about your shorts? I think they were my black shorts. Okay. Were you carrying anything else with you? No. Nothing. Nothing. What was my car keys? Where were they at? My pocket. Jeff, I, I, I just, I've always liked you. I, I understand that. And, then, and, and you understand okay. how difficult this is for, I understand how difficult it is for you and everybody involved. I understand that. I, and, but I didn't do anything wrong, but I'm a realist. I'm a realist. I understand. And I, and I think there's a whole lot more going on here than, than we're. And, 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 I'm, and I'm not willing, Jeff, to sit here all day long and, and talk about it. I, I understand, all right? I, there's something right here that, you know, you're a police officer. You know right from wrong. And I understand. I think you did wrong last night, and you think you did wrong last night. And I need to know why you did wrong. Because there, I didn't do anything wrong. Walking up from that lane towards the road is the right thing to do at that point. I mean, I can't go before the dog. Okay, so I walked up there. I mean, I mean, if it wasn't for the thing, I would just walk around the lake and went right back to where my truck was at. I mean, that is all. I'm not 
you know, I'm not minimizing anything. You are minimizing anything. No, I'm not. I'm not minimizing anything. I just. I mean, I don't know how simple it is. It's not. I, it's, I okay. it's not that simple. I didn't have ill intent of any kind. It's that's it. It's not that simple. I mean, that's it. It's not that simple. I mean, she was a young, attractive lady. I don't know where she is. Um, and like I said, I, I know. You know, I've seen you. I've seen how you. You take a genuine interest in people. Okay, and I think if you knew what you did to this person because I'm telling you she's freaking did not do anything to her. Kilo continues to deny everything and sticks to his side of the story. The possibility that he was looking for a property at night is extremely unlikely. And I wrapped up from the lake between the houses on the road. Yes, I did. Okay. You were there, right? Yes. Yes, I was there. Okay. You were confronted by Officer Zebra. Yes. Yes. He was there. I was wrapping up. Okay. Okay. What Let's just go with this in chronological order. First of all, is there any reason that you can tell me why David Zimmer would lie about this situation? Because I'll tell you what, he's freaked out too. Because you're one of his mentors. All right. You're one of his mentors. He is, I don't know how I freaked him out. You don't know how he freaked him out? Well, I mean, he couldn't even hardly talk. He was so upset by the situation. He talked about how you were, you know, one of his mentors. You were an FTO uh, training sergeant. All right. And I mean, he looked up to you. All right, I understand that. All right. And, okay, so getting back to the, the question, is there any reason why David Zimmer would lie about what happened? Officer Zemer was also struggling with the situation as he could not believe his mentor would be the one being called about. The fact that Pilo doesn't care about it just goes to show how selfish he is in his acts. As a matter of fact, he called off the second unit after he confronted you. Neither do I. I don't have any reason why. Everybody has their battles, and everybody has their crosses to bear. All right, I understand. All right? And you, you're, you know where we're getting at on. No, I don't. You don't know what you're doing. I, I'm, I'm talking about a, a, a young, very attractive female. I don't know who you're talking about. All right. She's the lady in one of those two houses. All right. I don't know. I, I have no idea who's in lives in either one of those houses. All right. I wasn't interested in those houses. I, I'm, I'm sure you had no idea who they were. All right. I wasn't interested in those houses. All right. You weren't interested in lake access. All right. Come, come on, Jeff. All right. I mean, yes. I mean, that's a... That is just a, it doesn't make sense to anyone. All right. It well, doesn't make sense. Again, does it? Yes, it makes sense to me because that's what I went there to do. If I'm going to look at a lake access, I'm not going to do it at 1230 in the morning. All right. Poor choice of times, but that's why I did it. All right. I just walked down there. All right. You're, what are you, 17 years? Yeah. 17 years of being a police officer. All right, I understand. And, and, and you don't think that that is a, a severe error in judgment to be all right, in between two houses at 12.30 in the morning, you all I was doing was walking from the lake to the road. All right? You're implying that I'm doing something mysterious between these houses, and all I'm doing is walking from the lake up to the road. I said, I, that's exactly what I'm implying, Jeff. That's it. That's all Because I'm Officer Zemer, who has... A, who you agree to says has no reason to lie about this. Says that you were up against the house, and he had and he had to he had to call for you three different times. No, he didn't call three different times. And then you turned around and walked the other way. Okay. Well, I saw the figure standing standing there. I was like, ah, I just turned and walked back. All right. what he, okay. What did he say to you then? When you returned around and he was walking back, what did he say to you then? Stop, police. And what else was he saying to you? Stop, police. Let me see your hands. I don't recall everything he said. I just said, stop, police. I, I realized, oh, it is the police. So I turned and walked back. Right. I mean, I, if I realized at first he was, he was, he was Officer Zemer, I just kept walking right toward him. But my initial thought was, it was someone that lived there. I said, oh, that's it. Yeah, you know it's not good. You know, that's it. It's not good. That's it. Because the scenario doesn't fit. You know the scenario doesn't fit. That's it. And, and, and here comes this old BS, but I think you've seen me interview enough people 
that I was lying on the line to. No, I something, you. something went wrong. All right. Something's wrong. I understand. You think something's wrong. Well, I, I'm convinced that I think something's wrong. Whatever scared that woman was not me. All right. The only time I walked in the room in house is when I encountered Officer Zeman. That's it. All right. I wasn't there before that at any other time. Whatever scared her, whatever it was, all right. Or whoever it was, was not me. He keeps denying, and the interrogator knows what he knows. Zemer had no motive against his superior and was completely shocked that he saw him at the scene. His denial, coupled with the way he smacks his leg, just goes to show that he's guilty and he's trying to cover up the real reason for the visit. He has no reasonable explanation. And every time the detectives bring up the weak points of his statements, he gets upset and falls back on blustering. It doesn't make sense. I, I'm just being real with you, Jeff. And I understand. I don't know what else to tell you. I wasn't doing anything wrong. I had. I did not. The only time I went between those houses is when I walked up and met Officer Zener. I did not do anything to anybody anywhere last night. Period. I, I don't know what you're trying to allege here. I did not do anything to anybody at any point in time. All right? I'm not looking in someone's windows. I'm not doing any of that. I walked down by that way. When, when that's what you said a minute ago. That you were looking. You said windows? somebody was walking around looking at this woman's hat windows. It was not me. Whoever it was, I have no goddamn clue. I don't no goddamn clue whatsoever. I don't know that I said. Uh, you know, I don't know how else to say it. All right. All right. The truth is the truth. I've already told it to you, and that's that. I don't know what else to do. Excuse me for getting pissed off here, but I didn't do anything wrong. All right. I did not do anything wrong. Period. I don't know how else to put it. I don't know how else to do it. I, I don't. I don't. Well, as as it's happened in the past, you know, and, and I'll just tell you, I, I'll tell you point blank. I don't think the story is exactly the way you're telling it. I don't know, I don't know what Dave Zimmer told you. All right. I, I don't know what his perception of it was. But the only time oh, I his, his perception is right on, Jeff. His perception is right on. Exactly right on. Yeah, I, and, 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 here, and here's the real story of it all, Joe. You're the one who has to answer for it, not David Zimmer. David Zimmer was on patrol. Answer. I'm not alleging he did anything wrong. All right. All right. I'm not. Again, I don't know what his perception of it was. I didn't do anything wrong. And I had no intent. I did was walk in that way and up between those houses. All right. You know, now I'm sitting in an interview room and accused of being a criminal. Obviously, I should have turned and walked back 50 feet and walked up to the, uh, the cul de sac that's right now. Cul de sac. Yeah, cul de sac's right there. Obviously, you should have done what again? I should have walked all the way back to where there's no houses and I walked up to the cul de sac. Obviously, that's what, you know, looking back on it, perhaps that's what I should have done. I, I, oh my God. Is that how you came around? Huh? Is that how you came around? To the empty lot? To see the, the spillway? There's no spillway there. Uh, whatever you call that, at the end of the cul-de-sac, right? Is that the way you went around? Originally, I started to come down off of whatever I can't remember what the street is. Come down, right? I didn't want it, so I walked up on the street, whatever that street's called. Uh, I can't remember the name of the street. Andy, Andy Court. Walked down to where that cul-de-sac is. Looked at that townhouse. Did not. I didn't go up to the windows of the townhouse. I looked at it from a distance to see if two-story where it was. If that's the one that was for sale, it was. I walked down by the lake, started going on the west side. It's like, no, I don't want to go that way. So I started to come around on the east side, walked around. That's where the little spillway thing comes down in. I don't know what you mean by spillway now. I realized, okay, I, I can't cross that. That's when I turned and walked up between the houses. Well, actually, I went down a little ways, realized that, went back. You know, one house had a fence, I believe. So I walked back. I guess it was one house, walked up. Between the houses, and that's why I'm not Officer Zimmer. What were we what driving last night? My pickup truck. It's going to take a minute to think about it. We'll never talk to you. Because if you take a minute and you think about it, and you put all I don't have to think about it. You put that's all, what happened. You put all the things together, uh, Jeff. That happened. All right. I get it. And you come up to a conclusion. How it may seem all right, is not. It's just a coincidence. It's just yes. a coincidence. I didn't do anything wrong last night. I didn't do anything to anyone. Again, you didn't do anything to anyone. I didn't do any one thing to anyone. 
From this point on, Pilo sounds like a broken record. Denying, denying, and that frustrated look every time he's confronted with a weak point. He's given a few moments alone so that he can rethink his story and possibly confess, because his denial isn't getting him anything. But even after he comes back, he goes back to being a broken record player, just denying it. So the interrogator drills deeper into his interaction with Officer Zemer particularly about the fact that he had a gun on him and he didn't even notice. You have got to be thinking that this isn't some fishing expedition. We just didn't pick you out of the clear blue sky to come in. All right, correct? Obviously. Again, the only thing I did was walk from the lake in between two houses out to up to the road. Out to off the road. Right. And when I realized somebody was up there, I was like, and when they turned to go back, and that's what he said. And I, went, I turned around and came back to him. Okay. But we're leaving out this. We're leaving out you. We're standing up against the wall like this. That did not occur. And an officer that did not occur. you twice. That did not occur. And then you no. turning no. and no. walking away. Did I turn? Your hands right here. And he no. says, "Stop! Show me your hands." And he has. And I mean, you've been in the ERU. I understand. You have been in. You're a weapons guy. You're a former military. I understand. And you're telling me you didn't know somebody had a gun pointed at you? He's backlit. I wasn't paying attention to that. You weren't right. paying attention to something. He said, stop. Wait a minute. I said, oops. It's the play. I turned and walked up there. That's that. I talked with him a few minutes, and not even a few minutes. All right? You know, he's obviously on a call. There's problems here, Jeff. There's, there's all kinds of problems. All right. And, you know, I'm not... I'm not here to sit and tell you that it's all rosy and all that kind of stuff, but no. And you know where I'm coming from because I've told you. I am not buying what you're telling me. I don't one second. For one second. You know that I've done this for a long time and you I've done it for yes, I have. You have done it for a long time. And I and I have anything wrong with I know you I know. And you know what? How many times have we sat in here and listened to somebody for hours and they're not doing something well, they did? I, I'm not going to be here for hours and then, telling you that I didn't do anything wrong. And then, you know, and have all the behaviors and all the things that are happening. You know, you were not Sergeant Pilo last night. You were absolutely somebody else. And we can sit here and you can say, this is what I did. And I can sit here and say, this is what we know till the cows come home. But you know... You know in your heart exactly what happened. Yes. Yes. I went down, went to that lake, walked between those houses, go back to the road, put on my truck, and that's what happened. That was the only time I was between those houses and say when we talked. It's obvious that Pilo is committed to his lie, so getting him to admit any wrongdoing is beyond reproach. After the two go back and forth, the interrogation finally ends, and the investigation begins. In June of 2006, the state charged Pilo with 37 counts of criminal conduct originating from two separate cases. Specifically, the state alleged that between December of 2002 and June of 2006, the defendant committed a series of crimes involving stalking, intimidation, home invasion, residential burglary, unlawful restraint, and aggravated criminal sexual assault of five women from the Bloomington Normal community. At the defendant's trial, which began in May of 2008, the state called more than 60 witnesses to testify that between December of 2002 and June of 2006, Pilo committed a series of signature crimes against women in the Bloomington Normal community. The four rape victims, who we'll call AM, KH, AL, and SK, testified and shared their painful recollections of those terrible nights. AM testified that in December of 2002, she woke up at 4.30 a.m., and discovered an intruder standing in the doorway of her Bloomington apartment. The intruder had a flashlight and startled her. He quickly approached her and covered her mouth. He placed a piece of twine around her neck, but she managed to persuade him to remove it by promising not to scream. Then, he held a knife to her head and demanded that she remove her shorts and underwear. Despite her resistance, he threatened to harm her if she didn't comply, so she reluctantly obeyed. He proceeded to engage in sexual acts with her against her will. Suddenly, he abruptly stopped, instructed her to put her face in the pillow, and stated that he would return shortly. After she heard the apartment door close, she locked her bedroom door and immediately called the police. AM described the intruder as a white male wearing a black ski mask, a black Carhartt coat, and jeans. Additionally, she informed the jury that her license plate at the time of the incident was Ammo Joe 58, and her roommate's license plate was Lacey Joe 5. 
surprisingly, these two license plates were accessed without legitimate law enforcement reasons the month before AM's assault by someone identified as J. Pilo through the Bloomington Police Department's Law Enforcement Agency data system, or LEADS. Furthermore, during that same month, an individual logged in as J. Pilo at the Bloomington Police Department accessed AM's parents' personal information through the National Crime Information Center, or NCIC, database. Then came K.H., who described her testimony regarding the incident that occurred in April of 2003 at her apartment. Her description almost matched the same as the previous victim, but one part of her testimony was just too disturbing. He took her cell phone and directed her to the bathroom, ordering her to get into the bathtub. There, he removed the duct tape from her wrists, turned on the water, and instructed her to bathe and play with herself while he watched. After some time, K.H. realized that he had left, allowing her the opportunity to free herself from the duct tape on her head and call the police. K.H.'s description of the intruder was the same as the other victim, and when shown a photographic lineup, K.H. identified the familiarity of the defendant's eyes. Additionally, evidence was presented to demonstrate that someone logged in as J. Pilo accessed the personal information of K.H. and her father through the NCIC database six months before the assault, and another individual logged in as J. Pilo accessed K.H.'s information through the Bloomington Police Department's lead system two months before the assault. Then we have A.L., victim number three, who provided her testimony regarding the incident that took place in January of 2005. A.L. went to bed, and then later woke up to find an intruder wearing a ski mask standing at the foot of her bed. The intruder assured her that he didn't intend to harm her, and forced her to roll onto her stomach. A struggle ensued when he tried to put a rope cord around her neck. Eventually, he turned her onto her back, displaying a knife and claiming to possess a gun. The intruder questioned A.L. about sex toys, asking if she had any, and then inquired about beer bottles. What he did with those is too sickening to tell. At this point, the intruder claimed that A.L. had talked him out of the mood. He instructed her to take a bath, and left the bathroom, only to return with a towel and her cell phone. After some time, she attempted to free herself from the zip ties and the intruder re-entered the bathroom. He ultimately cut the ties, warning her not to involve the police and stating that he would be watching her. As soon as she heard him leave, A.L. called the police using her cell phone, which he had left behind. A.L. described the intruder as a white male wearing dark clothing and a sweatshirt with the word England on the front, with the hood pulled over the mask. Photographic evidence was presented to establish that the defendant owned a similar sweatshirt based on his family's trip to England. During the trial, A.L. positively identified the defendant as the intruder. But the most sickening testimony was from victim number four, S.K. In October of 2004, as she returned to her apartment around 2 a.m. after work, she noticed a man walking strangely away from her building. The man's behavior struck her as unusual. The following day, her roommate discovered that the window screens in her bedroom were missing. In January of 2005, S.K., who had taken a day off to prepare for her wedding, arrived at her apartment around midnight after visiting her parents. She went to bed at approximately 2 a.m. Suddenly, at around 2.45 a.m., she woke up to find an intruder entering her room. The intruder, armed with a gun, forcefully instructed her to keep quiet and inquired if her roommate would be returning. SK informed him that her roommate wouldn't be back. After a brief struggle, the intruder pressed the gun against her head and demanded that she undress. SK described the intruder as a white male wearing a light-colored University of North Carolina hooded sweatshirt, dark blue jeans, a black neoprene coat, black gloves similar to those worn by wide receivers, and a black belt, which he used as a utility belt for his weapons. He concealed his face with the sweatshirt's hood pulled tightly, and a black scarf covering his nose and mouth. The gun he wielded was silver and not a revolver. The assault was nothing short of disgusting. And it's a miracle that he never got arrested for this victim alone. There was the use of a vibrator and lubricant, and it's all too disturbing to experience, let alone here. Throughout the assault, he repeated inappropriate comments and expressed a desire to shave her and assault her. After this tragic episode, he knelt next to the bathtub and freed her wrists by cutting the zip ties with his knife. He turned off the lights, exited the bathroom, and closed the door behind him. 
After waiting for what seemed like a couple of hours, SK left the bathtub and encountered a neighbor from the apartment above who was preparing for work. Noticing her missing clothes, telephones, and a fitted sheet from her bed, she realized that her cellular phone had been hidden in her apartment. In court, SK positively identified the defendant as the intruder. She also identified him from a photographic lineup and voice exemplar. Furthermore, she testified that the intruder shared the same distinctive walk as the man she observed walking away from her apartment in October of 2005. The most unimaginable part of all this was what he did to these four victims, and he got away with it every single time. It's a miracle that the fifth person avoided this entire debacle by calling the cops right on time. In June of 2008, he was convicted of 37 counts and was sentenced to serve a consecutive term of 440 years. In 2011, Pilo's attorney argued that the verdict should be tossed because the jurors were shown too much pornography from Pilo's computer. Unfortunately, his horrific acts were all there, and the appeals court ruled that a few of the images weren't relevant, but that the issue didn't affect Pilo's conviction. The jury recalculated the sentence, and Judge Robert Freitag reduced his sentence by 65 years. So now he'll be out of prison by the year 2383. That is, if that monster's still alive. In the end, it was a stranger danger call that got this monster behind bars for 375 years. Despite his denials, his loudness, and his frustrated looks, his two-faced persona finally came into the limelight. This was how an ex-sergeant got 375 years in prison. And as always, thanks for watching.